This morning, I invite you to look in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And you know, it seems like something we're all familiar with these days are masks. Anywhere you go, you might see any variety of masks. You might see a mask that looks something like this, or you may see one that looks something like this. You may even see a nice homemade mask that someone has put together that looks like this, or for the fashion conscious, you have both sides. You can switch back and forth. So we see a lot of masks. Um, we're all familiar with masks. I saw this week where um, Johnny Weaver had died. Y'all remember Johnny Weaver? Saturday mornings, you know, wrestling. Or we say down here, wrestling. Johnny Weaver wore a mask and became the, I, I can't remember what his, what his name was when he wore his mask. But he, he was no longer Johnny Weaver. He was Mr. Wrestling 2. That's what it was. Mr. Wrestling 2. Not the first one, but the second one. So he, he changed his identity just by putting on a mask. We, we know that some uh, sports athletes wear masks for a different reason. We know that at, um, at Halloween, children wear masks for a different reason. And when, you know, nowadays you can walk into a bank wearing a mask. But prior to the coronavirus, if you walked into a bank wearing a mask, you know, they... They didn't look too kindly upon you. So masks are something we've all become familiar with. Not always comfortable, but for some people, they're more comfortable wearing a mask than not. Here's what I'm getting at. I just consider true or false. People are more genuine and real when they are at church. And I'm not talking about just the building. Certainly, yes, the building, but when they are around the church or with the church, which is the people. People are more real and genuine then than they are at any other time during the week. I believe it's false. In fact, I believe that in most churches, people are perhaps least genuine and least real when they are in church than they are the rest of the week, at least some of them. Now, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, and it reads, For the Word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not the face, but the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, don't get me wrong. There are many wonderful Christian men <coughs> excuse me, and women who are as genuine and real as they can be when they come together with God's people. But you and I have all seen people who put on a mask, who put on a face when they're gathered with God's people. Something they don't wear the rest of the week. Excuse me. See, for some people, if you're, it's interesting for those who are her parking lot greeters. Some people notice the transformation that takes place out in the parking lot as the vehicles drive through the gates or through the, the, the driveways and into the parking spaces. They can see inside the vehicles and they can see a transformation taking place. It's as if those people are putting masks on before they get out of the car. They become different people 
from who they were at work or at school or at home in the last few days, since last Sunday maybe. They put on a mask that hides their true feelings, their true attitudes, their true motives, their true selves. And this transformation, it doesn't just take place for occasional church attendees. Sometimes it takes place in the leadership of the church. Sunday school teachers, choir members, deacons, even ministers who have masks that we put on when we come to church. And the reason people wear a mask, as we know, is to hide something. That's the purpose of a mask, to hide or to be somebody we're not. Another purpose of masks, as we have learned so well lately, is to protect ourselves and others. So we may wear a mask to protect ourselves from becoming emotional or to prevent what we might see as a, an attack from others, people who feel as though they're spiritually superior to us. For whatever reason, our masks become defense mechanisms. We become dependent on those masks to get us through our time with our church. Do you wear masks? And I'm not just talking about the fashionable or the kind that, that protect you from from viruses. Do you wear masks? If so, what kind of mask do you wear? This morning I want to examine three different types of masks that I believe are very common in churches. The first one I'll display for you. I won't put that over my head. You see the smile? See the smile? It's the mask of painlessness. The mask of painlessness. It has the big smile on it, no matter what's going on. How many times have you been in emotional agony when you came to church? Or when you got together with God's people? And then someone asked how you are, and you respond, I'm okay. Or, I'm fine, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. And all the while, you know you're lying. We're all guilty of this. Each of us as much as the other. We wear masks that say we're fine. And we do it to hide our pain. I have found myself in places where I had to wear a mask in the last few weeks. And... I've caught myself smiling at people under my mask. And then when I realized they couldn't see my smile, I felt pretty dumb. I felt pretty dumb. In fact, I, I realized I could be sticking my tongue out or making an ugly face or, and, and doing that, you know, and all the while going, hmm. But I don't. It's just... It, the mask hides what's really going on behind it. Sometimes we use humor to hide our pain. It's our way of denying the pain that we're experiencing. Some people leave churches. They're angry. They're hurt. And they say, you know, I'm really not upset with anybody. They say, it, it, just, it was just time for me to move on. God moved me on. When all the while down inside, they're hurting because someone was brutal to them. Because someone had hurt them so much 
They could not see themselves going back into church again. Sometimes they'll find another church, but sometimes they just drop out altogether. And while they may tell us they're not mad with anyone, sometimes those people are really hurting. I'm convinced that sometimes people are honest when they say, well, we're not mad at anybody. God led us somewhere else. God leads you somewhere else. You better go. But if God doesn't lead you somewhere else, you need to stay where he's put you. And if you're upset or hurt, you need to work it out with God's people. The tragedy of this particular mask is that we all encourage one another to wear it. Well, how in the world do we do that? We do so by telling people how they should really feel. You know it's true. We encourage them to deny their true feelings. Maybe unconsciously, but we do. We offer our experiences. You ever notice that? We often listen in order to speak. And so if someone tells us their pain, we're, we're working on our response to them the whole time. And they, they pour their hearts out to us. And as soon as we get a break, we jump in there. Well, let me tell you, here's what I went through. It was a lot worse than what you went through, and I got through it. So you can get through this. In other words, we don't hear them. We discount what they're saying, and we tell them how they should feel. We tell them they've felt sorry for themselves too long. It's time to move on. Move forward with your life. Or think about children. A child is crying. What do most people say as the first response? Don't cry. Don't cry. Everything's going to be all right. Why do we do that? Why aren't we instead taking them by the hand and crying with them and letting them know that their feelings matter? Jesus cried. So what would he do? Jesus is the most compassionate man who ever walked the face of the earth. You better believe he cried. We read in the Bible that he cried. Why do we try to discourage people from from expressing their true emotions? I believe it's because we become vulnerable as other people express their true emotions. We're afraid that if we let others express their true selves, we may open up our true selves and and then get too close and risk being hurt again. So we wear the mask, the mask of painlessness. This is the mask that says, I can handle any situation with a smile on my face. This is the mask that says, I don't hurt. See, I'm smiling. I'm too spiritual to allow someone to hurt my feelings. Well, I have news for you. The church is not a show place for perfect people, but it's a hospital for hurting people. The truth is, we all have hurts. Many times they're very deep hurts. And this is the mask that we wear in order to hide those hurts. It's the greatest temptation in the world to put that mask of painlessness on. That way, we don't have to say anything that might rock the boat. A few years ago, I heard Rick Warren make a statement that really caused me to think. He said, don't be afraid of rocking the boat if Jesus is the captain. Don't be afraid of rocking the boat if Jesus is the captain. So the first mask we need to throw away is the mask of painlessness. Just throw it away. Get rid of it. It causes us to face our hurts. It causes us to share our burdens, to depend on our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing anyway? There's another mask I want to talk about. And I couldn't think of a better mask than just a solid black mask. It's called the mask of strength. The mask of strength. This is a strong mask. It's, it, it, it's so strong it doesn't need any wording on it. Well, you know, you, we've seen a lot of cute masks that people have made. A, a, a friend got married recently. Uh, they went on their honeymoon and they had bride and groom masks. Said the first place they went in to eat, the people thought it was so cute they bought their lunch. So, you know, but but that doesn't say that you know that's that's not if that were pink, it wouldn't be as strong. But it's black. That's a strong color, and it's got these filters inside. So you know we know they're strong. They've got the filters to filter out any anything bad. And you know they. Apparently, they work. Um, this one research scientist this past week published a study where she had coughed. She was not sick with anything, but she coughed. Just a normal cough into a Petri dish. She, she did it once without a mask and once with a mask. And the results were, were amazing. The, the, the Petri dish that had that she coughed into with no mask just had all kinds of bacteria growing and just looked like you know something really creepy and then the other dish where she was wearing the mask was just clean and looked really nice looked healthy so apparently the mask the filters they work they help but you know what? When we wear the mask of strength, it, it becomes a very scary mask. We wear it, though, to the applause of the Christian world. We hear Christians say, oh, she is so strong, I don't know how she got through it all. Well, the truth is, she didn't. Either she's leaning on Jesus... Or she's and, and depending on his strength, or she's wearing the mask of strength. All the while she may be crumbling on the inside. See, the Bible tells us that in our weakness, he is made strong. We're instructed to cast our burdens upon him because he cares for us. But we're taught from childhood. To keep a stiff upper lip. If we appear strong. No one can intimidate us. Right? Unfortunately. Another side effect of strong appearances. Is that it's hard for people to get close to us. They perceive us as overbearing. As bossy. And controlling. Or even hard hearted. The sad truth is we may have become some or all of those things when we wear that mask of strength. The lie that Satan wants you to believe is that you are tough and strong and you can serve the Lord with diligence and not let your emotions lead you to make foolish mistakes. So you put on that mask of strength. And it makes us hard-hearted. Instead of trying to act strong and tough, we should take a lesson from Jesus himself and be more compassionate and kind. We should realize that humility is not denying our strengths. Humility is admitting our weaknesses. So let's throw out the mask of painlessness. Let's just get rid of it. The mask of strength as well. God needs more compassionate servants. He needs fewer bullies. 
And we have bullies in the family of God, unfortunately. God wants us to put aside our masks, to just throw them away and be real. There's a third mask. This one that we see an awful lot. It's the mask of good works. The mask of good work says, look at me. Look at me. It's, I can't wear this so much because I use magic marker. And when I put the mask on, I'm kind of get lightheaded there. So I have to be careful. But it says, look at me. Look at me. That's the mask of good works. And it's one that a lot of well-meaning Christians wear. And, and wear often. We figure if people see us doing good deeds... Serving on committees, teaching Sunday school, or giving offerings to help the needy. People see us mowing the neighbor's yard. They're going to recognize us as super duper spiritual people, right? The only problem with that is that when our motives are out of whack, we're laboring in vain. We can only please God. Rick Warren said in that same message I mentioned earlier. We can only please God when we decide to live our lives for an audience of one. The mask of good works, you could also call it the mask of pride. Say, how do good works and pride, what, what do they have to do with each other? Um, over in 1 Peter, chapter 5, here's what verse 5 says. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with pride. Is that what it says? No. It says, be clothed with humility. Humility for, and then he quotes the Old Testament. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, the one who, who screams, look at me. But he gives grace to to the humble. Max Lucado, Max Lucado says that God resists the proud because the proud resist God. And God gives grace to the humble because the humble are hungry for grace. What good are our works if they're not backed up with proper motives? Well, here's what Paul had to say about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you may know these words. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and knowledge, and understand, or though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. He goes on and on through here, describing what love really is. And then in the end he says, now abide, faith. Hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these, he says, is love. It's time for us, God's people, to stop worrying about keeping up appearances. Well, the church down the road is doing it this way. We need to be like them. No, we don't. That's the reason there's a church down the road in our church. It's time not to worry about 
keeping up with what others are thinking or doing. Instead, we need to model authentic Christian lives. We need to be who God made us to be, where he put us to be, doing what he's called us to do. When we get our lives right with God, he will help us to live a life of good works. We will do good deeds. That's not a bad thing. But our motives have to be pure. Our attitudes have to be right. Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. So that your good deeds will be done in secret. And he says, what will happen then? People will still see what you're doing. But they'll give glory to God in heaven. Not to us. So we don't do what we do to draw attention to ourselves. But to point people to Jesus. Looking back at our text. Hebrews 4. 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even through the division of soul and spirit. And of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight. He sees it all, folks. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. See, we don't have to answer to the church down the road. We don't have to answer to the Christian next door. We don't have to answer to the boss. We may now, but in the end, we don't have to answer to the boss where we work. God knows our true motives. He's the one we have to answer to. He sees the good and the bad in our lives. He knows when we're hurting. He knows when we're weak. He knows when we're sincere and when we're putting on a show. So what kind of mask do you wear, Christian? Do you wear a mask that says, I'm just fine. Nothing hurts me. I'm happy. I'm not in pain. Or do you wear one that says, I'm really tough. Nothing can hurt me. I'm tough. I'm strong. Or do you wear the one that says, look at me. I'm doing all these good things. Look at me. I'm, I'm a super Christian. Are you the same person when you're in church or with God's people that you are the rest of the week? I remember a number of years ago, um, was before the days of social media. Social media back then was email, if that tells you how long ago it was. Um, email, for those of you who are younger, is something that's kind of like writing a letter and then sending it through the computer. Um, not many people prefer email today, and I, I get that. But I remember a friend from college found me on the internet, found my email address somehow, sent me an email. I had lost touch with this friend for a number of years. He and I had been friends in college, but he was not part of the Christian gang, if you'd say, and, and even in a Christian school. He was kind of the guy who, when, when everybody got together to, to worship or to sing praises, he, he just kind of went off to the side by himself because he didn't, he didn't have any, any need for that kind of stuff. He didn't have any use for it. He didn't pretend to be a Christian either. So, you know, at least he had that going for him. He was authentic. But when he found me and sent me the email... We, we got to chatting back and forth, and he said, um, do you know preacher so-and-so? 
And I said, you know, I've heard that name. I haven't been in that town in a long time, but I've heard the name at that church. He said, that's my pastor. And I thought, hmm, you know, maybe he's met him a woman that's taking care of getting him, you know, before the Lord and has been on her knees and praying for him. And, and he said, just out of the blue after that, he said, bet you never thought I'd been in church. And I thought, you're right. You're right. I never thought you'd be in church. I remember this friend, he actually came home with me. Uh, when I, I was working as a part-time youth minister at my home church, and I would come home on Wednesday nights or Wednesday afternoons and do a Wednesday night program with the youth before going back late Wednesday night. And one week, I talked him into coming with me. But when it came time, he, he ate dinner with me and at my mom's, and she fixed a nice dinner. We ate. And, and then when it came time to go to church, he said, I think I'll stay here and watch TV. And we could not get him to go to church that night. He stayed at my mom's and watched TV. That was his thing. He was not going to church. His, nothing about his lifestyle would have led me to believe that he was a Christian. But now even he realized how, how astonishing that would be to people who knew him then. He said, I bet you would never thought I'd be in church. And you know, I was surprised that he was in church. But it began to resonate with me. As thrilled as I was and am that he knows the Lord and serving him. I wonder, are there people who would be surprised if they knew that I was in church or that I was a pastor? I've actually met some who, who said that. I never thought you'd become a pastor. What about you? People who really know you. Would they be surprised to know that you're in church? Are you wearing a mask of good works at church? But to the rest of the world, you're something different. It's time to throw out the mask of good works. Just get rid of it. Along with the mask of pain, painlessness. Along with the mask of strength. So, instead of the mask of strength, put on the mask of compassion. Guess what? You don't even have to wear a mask when you have compassion. It's kind of like, I've seen it advertised, the mask that some, some people have come up with that actually has clear plastic area. I've never seen anybody wear them. I've seen them advertised, but I've never seen anybody wearing one. But they have the clear plastic cut out. So that you can actually see them smile. They don't have to have their face covered. In other words. Is your mask one of strength? Or is it a mask that says. I'm fine while. You're really hurting inside. When God calls us. He calls us to be. What he made us to be. And the truth is. You are a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. You're a one-of-a-kind masterpiece. God didn't intend for us to be cookie-cutter Christians. We have different personalities. We all have different gifts. But we all have our faults. We all have our hurts, our pain, our needs. We don't need to put up a front. We don't have to do that. What we need to do is be transparent and real. And we can do that when we trust one another. When we become transparent and real, we, we take a huge risk. It takes a lot of trust to be real with people. But if we can't trust our brothers and sisters in Christ, who then can we trust?
more importantly, it's a waste of effort to, to wear masks because the one who really matters knows our true motives. He knows our real selves. So the government may tell you you need to wear a mask. A business may, may say you can't come in here without a mask. But when it comes to living your life for Jesus Christ, you don't have need for a mask to cover your true feelings. I'm not telling you not to wear one of these, but you don't need to wear one of those other masks. The one that says, I'm really okay. The one that says, I'm really strong. The one that says, look at me, I'm doing a lot of good things for God. It takes a lot of trust. Only when we take the risk of being our true selves can we have a chance of growing closer in love and in fellowship as a church than we've ever done before. And that's what will cause us to grow in Christian maturity. To grow as a church. Is the you that people see on Sunday when we're gathered together the same you that people see at work at school at home I hope so let's commit to being more authentic let's commit to being more transparent it might just cause us to experience revival revival would certainly be a good thing right now I'm going to ask you right where you are just to bow your head and allow God to speak to you. Father, it's always tempting to put on a mask when we're hurting, when we're feeling disappointed, when we're feeling all alone. It's so tempting to hide our true feelings or to say, you know, it's just not worth the risk of being authentic. The risk that we might be hurt. But Lord, we realize the only way we can, we can really grow to know and love one another is by being real. We realize that you have been real with us. Help us, Lord, to put aside those masks that we wear and instead to, to lean upon you when we do hurt or when we, when we do cry. Father, we pray that You would help us to grow in our, our faith and our trust for you and for each other. We pray, Lord, for those who, who maybe don't even have a relationship with you. Who are wondering, what can I do so that I can be authentic and real? Have your way as we commit to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.